Hi, everybody. Good to be with you tonight. I prepared another presentation here. And what I want to do in this presentation is I'm going to take this slowly. I'm not going to rush this. This may end up being a two part presentation here. But I want to do a deep dive into what the witnesses are seeing on these UFO sightings. What type of understructure are they reporting? Pipes, tubes, and cylinders. Uh, prongs and protrusions, balls and spheres at the end of these uh, protrusions. What are these features for? This can't be a haphazard type situation here. There has to be a logical explanation for everything that we're seeing on these UFOs. There has to be a reason for it. And I think I put together a little bit of a, a presentation here that explains partially what we could be looking at here. So this is going to be probably part one of this two-part series. And Title of this lecture is Man-Made UFOs, the Electrical Connection, Points, Prongs, and Protrusions, Static Spheres, and Sounds. So let's start looking at some of these cases here. And so after reviewing these UFO cases and what the witnesses are telling us, I started thinking, can we have a parallel? Is there a correlation between what we're seeing on these craft and what we see in high-voltage electrical equipment? So just start doing a side-by-side -side comparison here. Is there any kind of a parallel that we can draw? Is there any conclusions that we can make up here using these high voltage electrical components? So let's listen to what the eyewitnesses are telling us here. Go to the first case. This is November 20th, 1956, Danielson, Connecticut. And I've talked about these a little bit before, but in the context of this presentation, I really want to go deep down in here and see if we can make these correlations. So primary eyewitness saw this 25 foot across half sphere on the bottom of it. It was chopped off at 50%. There was an indented wall section about two feet thick. And then the primary eyewitness said that there was what looked like these Tesla coils on the bottom inverted with these donuts. So let's do a zoom in here and we'll get a little bit closer. She's watching all this thing as this things fly by, flew over the, uh, the clothesline here with some of the clothes that were already put up. And she got a real good look at the bottom of this thing. And now you can see this coming into view here. You've got these Tesla coils. You've got these globes. You've got these uh, donuts and then separated by a black band. That's kind of what she's describing here. And let's zoom in real close here. Donut-like rings on bottom of craft, identical to a toroid on a Tesla coil. That's what this thing looks like. I mean, it's got a very mechanical structure to it. It looks man-made. It even had this Aztec lettering on the bottom of it that looked like an ancient Persian rug, this hieroglyphic-type lettering on the bottom of it here. Now, this is her sketch. Fantastic job on this. Just absolutely beautiful job on this is original sketch. And you can see these donuts with the inverted hieroglyphic type writing and the black bands between each of these donuts. And let's see if we can figure out exactly what we're looking at here. So here's this side-by-side -side comparison, and it's really giving this man-made type conclusion here. So this is what the craft looked like. You can see that these lights were rotating, and she definitely said that there was this ancient Arabic language that looked like a border on a Persian or Oriental rug, or it might look like Mayan or Inca pottery on the underside of these donuts. Uh, each one of these sockets um, had a different colored light on it as well. So what could we have a corresponding electrical component to this? So if you look at a Tesla coil with a top load, you've got the primary coil, you've got the secondary coil, and let's go to the next slide here. This is the breakdown here. Now you can see the primary coil, you've got the secondary coil, and then you've got this toroid. Is this what our primary eyewitness was seeing? These stacked up and a Tesla coil, is that what she was seeing here? Note toroid on top, almost identical to what the primary eyewitness was describing here. Now, take a look at these Van de Graaff generators. Uh, you've got this static electrical charge, this field being... Uh, produced through static electricity here. And then on the top, you've got this discharge sphere. If you've ever been in a high school science lab, you may have seen one of these or at a science surplus store, you may have seen one of these or might have actually seen this actually working in action. 
And if we look at what our eyewitness is telling us here, is this what she's seeing? The, the top load toroid, is she seeing an electrical discharge sphere? That's what it appears to be here, a man-made component to this here. So then you start looking at these electrical substations and you have this low frequency electrical humming noise that we've heard again and again in these eyewitness testimony. Take a look at this, electrical transformers and they have these electrical bushings Again, we've got these donuts. Is this the bushings that are being employed in this craft? Or is this the, the top toroid of that Tesla coil? But either way, it's really looking like a dead ringer to these high voltage electrical components here. Now, next one, which is my favorite. This is a Project Blue Book case. March 23rd, 1966. This is Tem Temple, Oklahoma. Primary eyewitness was a man named Eddie Laxon. He was a private pilot. He had 5,000 hours pilot in command. He was working at Shepard Air Force Base as an electronics instructor. So it's 5.05 .05 in the morning. He's driving down the road. It's still a little bit dark out. So the sun was just coming up over the horizon. He's driving down the road and something blocks the way he's driving here. This was a best way to describe it. A bowling pin tipped over at 90 degrees. This thing was about 75 feet long, about nine feet tall. Over on the right, it had a bubble transparent canopy. The whole thing was propped up on what looked like pogo landing gear from the lunar landing project. There were two beaming spotlights that were directly forward facing, two beaming spotlights vertically facing downward. Aft of the front landing gear, there was a air stair door opened up. There was a man not an alien, not an extraterrestrial, a man about five feet 10. He had two piece military green fatigues on. He had a baseball cap with the bill turned up. He was shining a flashlight at the bottom of this air stair door. Now, Eddie Laxton went back to the trunk of the vehicle, was just opening up the trunk to get the camera. That's when this man noticed he was being watched. And we'll, we'll continue on here. Now, above this air stair door, there was a spire that swept back toward the aft end of the craft and it terminated in about an eight inch diameter ball. And that's what we wanna look at here. What is this spire that came back? What is this prong and protrusion that we see on a lot of these UFOs? Now, after the air stair door, there was a, about a three and a half foot diameter porthole window divided e into four equal pie segments. Just aft of that porthole window, well, this would actually be starboard side. Letters written in black, TL4768, written on the side of the craft. At the very end of the craft, there was what looked like flight controls that were way too small to be aerodynamically effective. Now, when the gentleman holding the flashlight noticed he was being watched by Eddie Lex, and he scurried up this air stair door, he slammed this door shut. Then there was a high-pitched drilling noise which I think is fascinating because this pops up multiple times. This high pitch whine, this craft levitates off the ground, sits there for 30 seconds and then takes off like a spark in a grinding wheel. And this is in 1966. This is before Apollo 11. Let's go to the next one here. In large view of discharge sphere at extreme end of spire slash stinger. Is this what we're looking at here? An electrical discharge sphere? just like a Wimshurst generator. Is that what we're looking at here? Take a look at this Wimshurst generator components. Off to the left, you can see you've got spark gap, you've got sec sections of the disks, and the spark gap, between the spark gap, you've got the balls, and then you've got the spires coming off, and, and it's a dead ringer for what Eddie Laxon had reported. I think it's very interesting. That's what we're looking at here. Uh, if you look at the man-made components here. Now, let's go to his drawing. Eight feet tall, 75 feet across. You've got that spire stinger with the ball at the end of it. And this protrusion with a sphere at the end of it keeps popping up again and again on these UFO cases. It just keeps on popping up. Now let's go to the refined drawing. Eddie Laxon said that <clears throat> Whatever this man with the green two-piece military fatigues, whoever he was, 
he had what looked like naval ranking insignias on his shoulder, which is another indicator that we're dealing with a man-made technology. Nothing alien, nothing extraterrestrial, nothing that came from the Andromeda galaxy light years away. This was something man-made. <laughs> this was something uh, nuts and bolts, maybe Atomic Energy Commission in conjunction with the United States Navy. But in his assessment, this was something man-made for sure. Now, here's official Project Blue Book index card. Just going to read the top part of the summary here. It says, observer spotted object parked on highway in front of his car. Observer stopped car and get out to investigate. But as he got close to the object, a man apparently entered the object and immediately the object began to rise from the ground. This is what he's reporting here. This is a Project Blue Book case. Now, here's Houston Post, April 10th, 1966. Laxon, who is familiar with aircraft, said he had no thoughts about the craft being from outer space or even from another country. It's an American piece of machinery, he said. It's nothing foreign. So in the assessment of Eddie Laxon, this was something not from another galaxy, another universe. This is something man-made. Here's the Daily Oklahoman, March 1st, 1971. Object sighting now ruined. So you can see this is Eddie on the upper right-hand corner, and you can see that in this newspaper clipping, he actually regretted even bringing this up because he had calls at three in the morning. He had calls from other countries. And the bottom line is he absolutely regretted even talking about this. So if you think about it, it actually adds to the credibility because he wasn't seeking fame or fortune, but he just got calls in the middle of the night. So it actually adds to the credibility. Now listen to what he said. This is part of the newspaper clipping here. What I saw was definitely not from space. The man was wearing fatigues and had a cap with the bill broken up like Air Force mechanics wear, Lex, and said it had common English letters on it. And this is a notation here. We should all consider very carefully the tremendous implications about what that statement really means. Because if we already had the technology to travel into space without using liquid rockets as early as March of 1966, then what was the Saturn V rocket for? What was all this for? What was Apollo 11 all about? Why do we need the Saturn V booster first stage with 7,700,000 pounds of thrust with this liquid rocket? What do we need this all for if we already have the technology to go into space? Now, take a look at these F1 engines. You've got multiple single point failures. You've got tubes. You've got uh, valves. You've got turbo pumps. If you lose any one of these, you could lose the rocket and you could lose the astronauts. I mean, we're, we're talking about multiple single point failures. Is, is this all really necessary or have we been sold a bill of goods? Have we been played? Have we been had? Is someone putting up a smoke screen with this liquid rockets and solid rockets? Is this all the way of the dodo bird here? 7.5 million pounds of, is this really just a joke or are we being had here? All right, let's take a look at another case. May 26, 1979. This is Calusa, California. Primary eyewitness was watching TV at night. <clears throat> it was about 11.30 p.m. Late at night. His wife and two kids were asleep in the uh, adjoining bedroom here. And all of a sudden, the TV goes out and the air conditioning goes out. So he goes to the back of the circuit breaker panel at the back of the house. He opens it up. Everything seemed to be okay there. He looked up, and the first thing he noticed was that the hair on his head, the hair on his arms, and the hair actually on his hands was not only sticking up straight, but was crackling. The entire localized area was in this static electrical field. He looks up, and he sees this 140-foot diameter dish-shaped craft. It had what looked like conduit pipes with frayed edges at the bottom. It had prong sticking out of either side. At the top, it had a dome, but this dome was different. This dome had what looked like ridges on it. It looked like a lemon squeezer or an orange juice squeezer. On the top of it, there was a little bit of a point there. Now, as he looked off to the left, he could see two smaller craft that were half the size of the original craft, and they were pulling 
power off the 500,000 volt power lines, causing them to become cherry red. So now we've got a CE1 case and we've got a CE2 case because it had <clears throat> physical effects. Now, as this thing was getting ready to, to depart, it retracted these conduit pipes into the bottom of the craft and these prongs retracted 90% up into the side of the craft. At the very same time, these gooseneck lights popped out and it had a light on either side. At this point, you know, he said, you know what, I'm going to go in, I'm going to check with my family. Here's the drawing from the newspaper clipping. And this is actually 1976. You can see this orange juice squeezer uh, type of a dome on top. And then you've got these conduit pipes and these frayed edges. And this is what we want to look at. We want to look at these frayed edges. What are they for here? Uh, okay, I'm terming these ramen noodles because they look like ramen noodles, okay? So if we do a zoom in here, we'll do a blow up. There's got to be a reason for the conduit pipes and there's got to be a reason for these frayed edges. It cannot be haphazard. There has to be a logical reason for this. Now, when I gave this presentation at MUFON Symposium almost two years ago now, after the presentation, a gentleman came up to me and said, Mike, I know what these are. I said, what is it? And he said that it's a static wick and it's used to dissipate static electrical charges. I said, oh, wow, this is interesting. So I started digging <clears throat> and you can see here, static electricity dissipator, a static wick. I've got the contractor here. Here's the part number. They sell for $192. These are deployed with when it's in the vicinity of a localized ground area at low altitude and getting ready to depart. These things retract up and this thing takes off. So he wakes up his wife. He wakes up his two kids. They open up the blinds of the rear window here. They're looking outside and they see this large craft flanked on either side by two smaller craft. And they're pulling power off the 500,000 volt power lines. And again, this is 1976. He noticed something very interesting next. That large craft, 140 feet in diameter, went from a dead standstill to hovering over the low rolling hills in the background, 25 nautical miles away. And it did it in about one second. And then it came back, repeated the maneuver, came back in a second, no sonic boom, and it had traversed 50 miles in less than two seconds, essentially. This is back in 76. Someone's got this technology and they're not letting us know about it, that's for sure. So at this time, he piles his wife into the pickup truck. He piles the uh, kids into the pickup truck. They're going 90 miles an hour down the road. And this craft is following them at 90 miles an hour. It goes over the cab of the vehicle, goes over to the uh, driver's side, up over the cab, over to the passenger side where the wife is, then comes back over to the driver. Here's the newspaper clipping, San Antonio Express, February 6, 1977. Family tells of terror as UFO chased car at 90 miles an hour. So bottom line is when they get to the neighbor's house down the road, they slam on the brakes, they all pile out, they basically knock on the neighbor's door, two neighbors come out, so you've got the original four witnesses plus the two neighbors, six eyewitnesses saw the large craft depart at a high rate of speed at about a 45 degree angle, all back in 1976, no sonic boom, 1976. Next one, Chicago O'Hare Airport. This is April, May, 2001. I actually spoke to the original eyewitness. Now this happened uh, the night before. So the morning of it was still wet at O'Hare Airport. So the tarmac was wet. And there were six eyewitnesses at something called the Ozark Hangar, which you see here. Now, this craft was actually circular in shape, but in this view, it kind of has this cigar type configuration. And you can see there were 12 what looked like lighted, uh, lighted slots or um, these slots with a bubble transparent canopy up on the left-hand side at the front. And then he said, according to the primary eyewitness, there was what looked like these octopus tentacles that were moving like they were alive and they had a sphere or ball at the end of it, just like Eddie Laxon had talked about. So now we've got three cases of these spheres. Now let's go to his drawing here. This is his original drawing. If you look on the bottom right-hand section, 
there were also the prongs and protrusions with spheres at the end of them. So not only do we have them on top, but we've got them on the bottom as well. Now, as this thing is flying by, at least six eyewitnesses saw this, and it flew by this Ozark hangar. And then the primary eyewitness said that there was this low rumbling noise in the background. It was a 747 on takeoff roll that just missed this craft as it passed an active runway. So if it happened 30 seconds earlier, there could have been a mid-air collision. So whatever or whoever was flying this craft or was operating this craft, there was intent to it. There was intelligence to this. So again, look at these octopus tentacles with these balls at the end of, does this look like an alien spacecraft? Does this look like something ET or does this have a much more man-made component here? Here's top view looking down. Now you can see this circular section. There was what looked like a hatch at the top part about 50 feet in diameter with these octopus, octopus tentacles that were alive with these spheres at the end of them here. Next one, October 9th, 1972. This is Long Island, New York, Smithtown. So primary eyewitnesses are driving down the road, 1972. It's pretty dark out. They're watching these double row of lights that are kind of going parallel to the driver. And then all of a sudden, the husband pulls off to the side of the road Wife gets out. She goes to the oncoming traffic on the opposite direction of the, of the uh, highway here. And she looks up and she sees literally a flying iron, black in color. It has two rows of lights that are at the perimeter of the craft. A green light on the right, a red light on the left. And then she said that there was these poles sticking up, connecting the poles with what with looked like a small wire or a little bit of a bar going across the top of it. Here's the UFO investigator, February 1973. They go into this case in great detail, but again, you can see these poles sticking up with a wire going across. Does this look uh, man-made? Absolutely. It doesn't look ET at all. Here's the original sketch from the primary eyewitness. Object as it was seen uh, was leaving, flying very slowly from east to west. Object appeared approximately eight inches long and six inches wide as held at arm's length. And so you can see these poles sticking up with the wire connecting the top of the poles. So what does this remind us of? If you look at these lifters that have been going around for the last 15, 20 years, you'll see that they have this capacitor section. They have these poles sticking up. They have a little bit of a, a wire going across that's connected to the power source. It makes this hissing noise like snakes, which is reported. So is this a pre-production early prototype of these electrogravitic craft using high voltage electrical charges based on the B-field Brown effect? Is that what we're looking at here on these UFO cases? Let's go to another one. June 29th, 1964, Livonia, Georgia. This is 12 feet across. Sources uninvited guest by Richard Hall. Now, this primary eyewitness is driving down the road. He's going fast, and this, what looks like a flaming top, starts following him, goes up to the hood of the as he's going 55 miles an hour down the road. This thing kind of does an orbit, then goes away. It comes back a second time. He eventually pulls off to the side of the road, and he notices that the front part of the hood has melted paint on it. So it's a CE1 and it's a CE2 because it had secondary effects. Now, here's the cover of the book where you can get more detail. And I'm gonna go ahead to continue with the newspaper clipping here. Greenville News, July 25th, 1964. Uh, there was not a cloud in the sky report. Strange object was simply ball lightning, Air Force declares. Oh, okay, that's what the Air Force states. Now, if it's ball lightning, how could it parallel his car twice? And how could it damage and melt the paint on the hood? This doesn't sound, this sounds like something different here. Let's go to another one. Man claims car buzzed by an unknown object. Index Journal, July 3rd, 1964. Let's go to the uh, newspaper clipping blow up here. Parham said the incident occurred Monday night while he was driving near Livonia in Northwestern Georgia. He said a circular object which made a hissing sound made two passes at his car but flew away when he pulled off the road and turned off his car lights. So here we go. It says a hissing sound. Mm, this is interesting. 
That's exactly what the lifters make when they're energized and they crank up the voltage. Exactly what they make just before they take off and then they start hovering, they make this hissing noise. Exactly what this primary eyewitness is describing here. Craft sounded like a group of snakes hissing. Identical noise heard during lifter experiments. Yeah, again and again, as we build this case, it's looking like a man-made component here. Let's go on to the next one. Talked about this one before. February 3rd, 1983, Mobile, Alabama. Primary eyewitness is driving down the road. It's at night and it's about 9.30 p.m. She hears this booming noise. Her car starts shaking. So she pulls off to the side of the road. She thought something was wrong with the transmission. So she looks under. Everything seems to be fine there. She gets back in, drives another half mile down the road, and she sees this craft above the ground about 50 feet. She gets out of the car. She starts looking at this thing at close range. It was about 210 feet long, 80 feet high. And if we start at the upper section here, it had a transparent section wrapped around the first one third of the craft. And she said she could see what looked like five foot 10 humanoid looking beings. They didn't look ET or alien. They were all wearing a one piece tight fitting flight suit. It looked like a sterile antiseptic environment. Below that, there was another transparent panel. Below that, there were what looked like uh, multicolored lights, which I'm going to talk about later. Now, below that section was what looked like multiple sandboxes with protrusions sticking out. Then she said there was a door closing from right to left. This whole thing was fastened by what looked like bridge rivets and plates, she said. On the bottom of the craft, there was a gondola with the same five foot 10 humanoid looking beings. Now at the very bottom of the craft, there were hundreds of these 12 inch by 12 inch highly polished reflective mirror devices in the form of a cross at the bottom of this thing. Now, when she's looking through the craft, she said she could see what looked like cross beam and girder constructions or look like bulkheads at an East Coast shipping yard. That's what it looked like in the interior. Now I'm gonna to go to the front view. Now you can see a front view with this door closing from right to left. You've got all these windows, these uh, porthole windows that she could look through at very close range. So this is February 3rd, 1983, Mobile, Alabama. Here's the uh, APRO Bulletin, Volume 32, Number 2, 1984. That's the reference of where I got this information. Now, there's an interesting development in this case. I got a text from somebody I didn't know. And... It turns out that it is the primary witness of this case. All these years later, this primary witness texts me and she said, Mike, I've been trying to reach you for years. I saw your presentation. I've been trying to reach you for years. It's the actual witness. Can't believe it. She, she gives me a text. So we start talking for weeks and she says, you know what, Mike? I've got the original sketches. I still have them and I want you to have them. And she sent me the original sketches. This is what you see. This is a world exclusive. This is what you see right here. These are her original pencil sketches. I can't believe she actually sent me her originals. So if we break this down here, now you can start seeing this crap actually come into view because there were some serious errors in the APRO bulletin. They did not represent it correct. So number one, you've got this wraparound window. Number two, You've got a white light in the front center, a blue light, and then flanked on red lights. So that's really not talked about too. Then, which isn't represented at all really in that April bulletin, there's this huge bar running across the front of this thing. This bar is made up of multiple cages. And within the cages, there's tubes, there's pipes, there's mechanical components. Connected to this bar, there's what look like cannons that can rotate. Now, I don't think that this is a weapon system. Now, there was a road going through the front of this craft all the way through the body of the craft going out the side of it. Let's go to the next drawing here. This is a little bit of a three-quarter view. Again, you've got all these transparent porthole windows. Now you can see these bars on top of this section here with all these cages and components on it. Here's her side view. There was a single gondola not a double gondola, but a single gondola. And then it looked like there was a C-130 aft door that was open at the very end of this craft. Now, as this thing was going by, she said 
she heard announcements as this thing is flying by, but she couldn't understand what the wording was. But she said there was some type of audio announcement when this thing was flying by. So I said, Rudy, let's get together. Let's have our primary witness on the phone and let's do this in real time. Here is the refined drawing signed off by the primary eyewitness that represents all of the corrections that needed to be made. So we've got the configuration. We've got all of these battleship plates. We've got the rivets. We've got the porthole windows. Now, she said that this thing looked like it had been around for 100 years, somewhere in the 1800s, or like it was dipped in the ocean and then rose again with all this water and rust dripping off the side of it. So it had these rusty rivets. It had these rusty plates. It had been around for decades. Now you see this frontal bar here in the center, center of it with these prongs sticking out here. Let's do a blow up. Now you can get a, a good view of what this thing looked like with this cages and pipes and cylinders here. So I'm going to ask the question again, according to the witness. Now, does this look like an ET spacecraft or does this look like something much more man-made, uh, something that was made with good old fashioned American ingenuity or whoever built this thing because she said it had streaming rust streams coming off these rusty rivets. So here's a world exclusive illustration by Joel Payne. I want to give credit to him. The actual case took place January 1st, 1981, not 1983. It actually took place in 1981. Now let's go to the blow up here just to give you an idea of what this craft looked like blown up. Now you can see these five foot 10 humanoid looking beings with the white one piece tight fleeing flight suits. You've got this massive bar going across the front of it with these pipes and cylinders. And we've got these prongs or protrusions sticking out. Now, are these the same electrical discharge devices that we've seen on the other cases? I don't want to jump on the bandwagon and say that these are cannons or directed energy weapons, but I'm going to err on the side of what the witnesses are telling us in conjunction with the other cases. We could be looking at some type of electrical discharge unit in conjunction with this case here. Now, again, you can see these rivets, these panels. It's looking very man-made. It's not looking ET, according to the witness here. Again, now we can see this bar coming into view with this prong or protrusion that could be mistaken as a offensive weapon system here. All right, primary eyewitness noticed a chopping wind, a high pitched sound, a roaring sound, as well as the vibration. She noted a whipping of the wind like a tornado. Again, this high pitched drilling noise keeps popping up on these cases. Like before these things are getting ready to take off, there's always this high pitched drilling noise here. All right couple other things here, and we'll rip, rip through these here. Uh, again, why do we see pipes and cylinders on the bottom of the craft? Uh, this is Repton, England, November 1994. I talked about this before. Primary eyewitness is driving down the road, and he sees this very strange craft that looks like a horseshoe, has a notch cut out of the back of it. There's two beaming spotlights. He's doing his morning commute. He looks up, and he sees tubes, pipes, and cylinders on the bottom of the craft. This pops up at least six other cases in these cases. Here's the newspaper clipping. Burton Daily Mail, February 17th, 1995. Here's my SOLIDWORKS rendering. Again, what are the pipes? What are the cylinders? Is this another technology that we want to talk about here? Are we talking about a very intense liquid mercury cooling apparatus to turn the entire bottom of the craft into a superconductor because we're talking about something that needs to be chilled down before it can be superconductive. <clears throat> Is that what we're looking like at the bottom of the craft? Are they being turned into superconductors? Next one, this is England, 1994. More evidence of pipes and tubes and cylinders. Primary eyewitness was driving down the road when he looked up and saw this square on the bottom of the square, there was what looked like tubes and pipes and cylinders. Now, as this thing flew by, this wasn't just a square, but this was the base of a, tr of a pyramid. Now, when he had to walk his motorcycle about three miles back, investigators got to him. Here's the newspaper clipping. About two weeks later, they interviewed this gentleman in great detail. And one of the witnesses, one of the interviewers, 
was talking to the primary eyewitness. He was getting ready to bring out a lighter, which was one of these metallic Zippo lighters. And when he brought it out, it leapt out of his hand, went right to the gas tank. The entire craft was magnetized. So this is a CE2 and a CE3 because it had physical effects. Here's kind of my cardstock drawing a model that what this actually looked like. Now, if we invert this, now you can see these pipes and tubes identical to what the eyewitnesses are describing here. I wanted to cover another case. Now, I actually interviewed the two primary eyewitnesses on this particular case. This is summer 1978, Santa Clarita, California, 50-foot diameter dish-shaped craft. Primary eyewitness was cleaning the pool. This was kind of at night. Looks up, sees this 50-foot diameter dish-shaped craft. It has a very interesting understructure. It had a dome on top with what like put porthole windows. And then if we go to his original drawing, now you can see the original drawing. Side view projection based on partial view from underside. Dome on top, lights visible on approach. Entire craft luminous as if light came from within skin. Now, no rivets made out of one solid piece here. But let's take a look at what the witness described here. Take a look at these ski-like devices. Almost look like Santa's sleigh coming at the very front portion here. What would an ET craft need these prongs and protrusions for? Let's do a little bit of a detail view. This is my refined AutoCAD SOLIDWORKS drawing. And you can see these S-shaped electrical discharge prongs and protrusions. This is what our witnesses are describing here. I'm gonna to go to the next one here. If you look at the upper right and the lower left, these are his sketches. This is what he said was sticking out of the craft, this prong and protrusion. So I'm thinking, what would this be used for? Is this similar to the other protrusions we've looked at at the other cases here? Here's my revised AutoCAD drawing. And why would ET craft need these? Why would an extraterrestrial craft, maybe a million years ahead of us in technology, ride around in these craft that have prongs, protrusions, spheres, tentacles, uh, donuts, top loads from Tesla coils? When you look at the evidence, it's pointing to a man-made technology here. It, it kind of looks like this wrought iron artwork. That's what our witnesses are describing here within these cases. We can do another one. This is May 14th, 1988, Gresham, Oregon. More prongs and protrusions. Two witnesses driving up down the road at night. They see this interesting dish-shaped craft that has 12 illuminated windows. Now, these illuminated windows, they wrapped around the outer circumference of the craft itself. And it had a conning tower up on top. There were two what looked like half basketballs and then there was a prong sticking up. Here's the drawing of what it looked like. It was about 45 feet in diameter. And again, you can see this prong sticking up and this conning tower. Here's Rudy's drawing of what this craft looked like. And they saw this thing. Um, there was a commercial airliner that flew by and this craft went up to where the wing of the commercial airliner was made about two orbits ar around it. And then she said, as it got bored of the airliner, it took off at a high rate of speed. And this is back in 88, they're describing this. Next one, February 19th, 1968. This is in Canada. This is a very good case. Primary eyewitness was in the kitchen. She noticed a high pitched drilling noise, looked toward outside the window, and she saw that this dish shaped craft, eight feet in diameter, was doing an orbit around the electrical pole and then it came down, hovered over the farm, made a magical mystery tour around the entire farm. And then she got a good up close view of this thing. And I'm gonna do a blow up here. Take a look at what she described. I'm gonna do one more here. She said it had three legs sticking up with what looked like a baseball or golf ball on top. The dome of this craft had vents. And then she said it had plates and rivets holding the whole thing together. Let's go to the next one here. Now you can see all these plates holding this thing together and rivets. So does this look like an ET spacecraft or does this look like a much more man-made type configuration here? Here's the uh, flight path. So when you have a three-page report, you've got an original sketch and you've got a flight path report. 
you've got yourself a real case here. You've got three criteria that make an absolutely historical case. So you can see the farmer's house, you've got the garage, you've got the pole where this thing orbit, and then this tour that the craft made all around the farm. And she got a real good close up view of this craft. Here's these vents on the top with this golf ball up on top. And then we'll do a, a little bit detailed view here according to the original sketches within the three-page report. This actually came from QFOS Center for UFO Studies. It's been buried there for years. All right, I think we've got time for one more here. This is South Carolina, September 11th, 1980. Notice that this thing is 100 feet in diameter. It has a prong coming off the bottom of it, lighted illuminated windows, and then lights wrapped around the outer circumference of the craft itself. I'm going to do a blow up here. Note prong and protrusions. Do aliens, do extraterrestrial craft need these types of prongs here? Let's go to the newspaper clippings. Times and Demo uh, Democrat, September 14th, 1980. Some of the residents said before the deputies arrived, the dish-shaped object hovered over their homes, lighting the area and making a humming noise before it zoomed away. Yeah, like this low frequency electrical humming noise, like an electrical transformer or a sewing machine, that pops up again and again in these cases. Noisy UFO wakes Anderson resident streaks off. A dish-shaped unidentified flying object awakens some Anderson County residents on Thursday with a humming noise and bright lights before speeding away. Times and Democrat, September 12, 1980. So another report of this humming noise associated with a vehicle, unknown craft that has a prong coming out of the bottom. It's again looking very man-made here. Now, we wouldn't be complete if we didn't talk about the 2004 USS Nimitz Tic Tac UFO encounter. And you can see that the intelligence community, the military industrial complex, they are trying to make cases prior to 2004 disappear, but we won't do that. We won't let that happen because if you look at the Otto Binder reports, Wacom, Pennsylvania, March 1967, primary eyewitness saw a Tic Tac shaped UFO. It had six booms or prongs and protrusions sticking up, and then it had these spheres at the end of these protrusions, just like we saw in the previous cases. This is back in 1967. This is long before 2004. Here's my AutoCAD drawing that gives you an idea of what these prongs would look like. And then if we do a full color rendering, this is my, what the primary eyewitness is describing. You've got these prongs and protrusions with the balls at the end of them. And then we do a side-by-side -side comparison. This is what's talked about in the high def definition, high resolution uh, footage that isn't released or talked about too much. But if you do some digging, this craft also had prongs and protrusions. So on the right, we've got 1967 Wycombe, Pennsylvania. On the left, we've got 2004. So this technology has been around a lot longer than I think some people are aware of. Now, she also said that this thing looked like a boiler. It had rivets on it. You've got prongs and protrusions. We're talking about a man-made technology here. Now, in part two of this presentation, I want to go over the historical legacy of gravity research, and I want to give you the newspaper clippings. I want to give you the historical data from the trade publication. So we've set the stage for what the witnesses has talked about. In part two of this, in our next week, we're going to go into how we can prove that this is man-made technology according to the eyewitness reports, the newspaper clippings, and the trade publications. And I want to thank you for your attention. And one other thing, please like, share, and subscribe. It would definitely help out the channel. Thanks a lot.